I'm really excited today to talk to you about the rise of convenient care, uh, retail clinics, healthcare apps, and robots. Just think how healthcare has changed, okay? Obviously, when you look back, say, 15, 20 years, well, just maybe go back to my youth, okay? When I was young, back when the earth was still cooling, like a long time ago, when I went to kindergarten, my two concerns were in 1956, the atomic bomb and polio, okay? So think, think how things would change, you know? I was concerned, I went through the missile crisis. I remember that year in school, several of my classmates were just, they disappeared, and everybody goes, where did they go? Polio, so again, we don't even think about polio now, do we? But transitioning in healthcare is key. When I came here yesterday, or from Las Vegas, and, and the whole trip, as a matter of fact, I talked to zero human beings, okay? And you think, oh, how did I do that? Well, my travel was made online, okay? Now, I did get greeted by the flight attendant when I came on the plane, okay? When I get, I'm very lucky because I travel all the time. Um, when I looked at uh, National Healthcare, does a great deal for me. Wherever I am at the airport, when I come out, the car is waiting for you, and there's a little code that's in my phone, and the car is waiting. I don't have to get on a bus or anything, which is great. So I came here without any, talking to anybody. And that's why people are looking now to get their health care, right? Convenience. I love this slide. It says, you know, you can do this as easily online. Well, yeah, we can do everything online, okay? We can, you know, obviously, I applied for, turned 67 this year. Finally, somebody said, you got you know, you to apply for Medicare. And I said, yeah, I, got, I get it. You know, I'm still insured. But so I go down there. I get a letter from the Social Security Department, right? We've had some fraud. You need to come down and verify you're who you are. And I said, well, how do I do that? And they said, bring your driver's license. Have you ever been to the Social Security office before? <laughs> it's a tough one, okay? But, again, because it was fraud. And I said, okay, I, I get it. I get it. They, you can apply now for everything online, but there's people you know, with fraud. So I get that, but it's convenient. And when you look at this, say people want it all and they want it right now. Who has dogs? I don't call anybody, but who's a, who has dogs? Just show me hands. Do your dogs like bones? Show hands. Yep. yep. Well, the thing is, they do like bones, but your dogs really like steak. But they settle for bones, right? <laughs> the U.S. patient public does not want bones anymore. They want steak, and they want it right now. And we're seeing this. And when you look now in America, convenience is the king. I was talking to Cynthia this morning. She was talking about Amazon. Do you know what this is? Amazon Dash, okay? That basically is a little, uh, uh, it, I think it's a, I don't know if it's magnetic, I think it's magnetic. It Maybe it sticks on your, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's double-sided tape, thank you. Anyway, anything that saves time. Well, this is so, for Amazon, if you're sitting there, you're doing laundry and you go, I'm out of soap. You hit it. You don't even have to go to your phone. And the next day, guess what? Tide's at your front door. And this works because my granddaughter indicated to me that it worked because she pressed it three times. The next day, I had three two-gallon <laughs> bottles of Tide in front of him. <laughs> but that's when you look at it and you say, okay. No, she actually went to it three different times during the day. So, and again, I was, it was the whole idea of this trying to get this concept across. Well, this is transitioning into healthcare, right? And look at this. I mean, people want, they want service, you know? Reflexes seem normal. He kept him waiting for over two hours. I mean, uh, it, when you look at it, you know, I was talking again to some other people this morning. They said, how do you get your health care? I'm always on the road. I mean, I'm on the road, you know, 40 weeks out of the year. A lot of times it's just wherever it's convenient. As a matter of fact, my brother called me. We'll talk about this. And he said, I got a, he's two years older. He said, I got a case of shingles. I said, I understand. And he goes, have you had your shot? And I go, geez, I haven't. So I'm on the road. I go into Walgreens. They pull up my insurance. They say, here you are. Okay? Yes, you're qualified for it, whatever. Okay? So, but when you look at it, the next day when I got home, what happened? I got an email and said, thanks for coming in for your vaccination. Okay? By the way, your six or four different prescriptions that you take, we could fill over here at your hometown in Texas. Okay? Also, next month, you're going to need a pneumococcal pneumonia shot said, by the way, your last doctor visit indicated this. They knew everything about me, okay, by one vaccination, okay? And that's, they're trying to look at it. They say, oh, well, I get it. Well, we all get it too. And again, why convenience? It's demand, su supply and demand. As Rhonda said, we wrote a book, 2003, called well, The Last Physician in America, Please Turn Off the Lights. And sadly, it talked about the coming doctor shortage. 99% of it's true today. The American Association of Medical Colleges, which we'll talk about, just recently released a report saying we're going to have a doctor overage. 
or oh, a doctor surplus. Ten years ago, the same the American Association of Medical Colleges it indicated we we're going to have 100,000 too many doctors. Everybody remember the big joke back then? Doctors used to say back at the turn of the century. The big joke was, what do you do when a radiologist knocks at your door? Anybody? Pay for the pizza? Because they were going to be out of work. There was not going to be enough of them. But now radiology is the number four search we do every year. It dropped off the chart, but it's cyclical. It goes round and round. And again, we didn't go from 100,000 sur uh, surplus. We went from 100,000 surplus to 120,000, which we'll talk about, predicted shortage. Now, that, is that 100,000? No, it's 200,000. Remember new math from grade school? It was negative, positive. So we missed it by 200,000. And Yogi Berra hit it right on the head. Remember what he said? He said, making predictions is really, really tough, especially about the future, right? We goof. We didn't predict how long we were going to live. We have 57,000 centenarians in America today, more than any other country. And you would think India and China, just on how many in you know, the numerics of their population. But just think about it, 57,000 people that are over the age of 100. And as they get older, what are they going to need? Healthcare. All right. The second closest country, by the way, is Japan. Estimates are, ladies and gentlemen, by 2030, we'll have a quarter of a million people in America living over the age of 100. Hopefully not driving next to you down the road, right? But who's going to take care of them? And this new model of delivery has to be incorporated in this. So again, rising demand, static supply. Um, uh, anybody know Fandango? Everybody use Fandango? Okay. I, kinda, I always try to look in the room. They would say, speak to your, uh, to your crowd. But I, I don't want to call out people on age because I think it's a HIPAA violation, isn't it? But remember when you used to go to the movies and you stand in the one line to buy the ticket, and then once you got the ticket, you went in the other line? Yeah. Well, Fandango eliminated that, right? You can go, you can find out, look at the movie, see the trailer, find the reviews. Then if you want to go, you can buy the ticket. You don't have to do all that other things. What's healthcare trying to do? Well, find out why you're coming, what's your background, the review, what you need, and where to go, and what time. Same with Fandango. What else? Well, we goofed. Remember, and this is not anti-left or right, because I come to you from the I don't come to you from the right or the left. I come to you from the patient side today, all right? Because again, we're all going to be patients, right? I am now. We're all going to be patients. In fact, my father, he was the king of the one-liners. He told me one time, he said, don't get too excited about life because nobody gets out of this thing alive, right? <laughs> kind of funny. Anyway, <laughs> but when you look at what we're doing in America right now, uh, Hillary Clinton, back in 1992, when they tried to redesign health care, it was based on the fact of what? Let's insure everybody, very similar to the ACA. All right. But it was based on the fact we were going to have zero population growth. Zero. Okay. We goofed. Oops. 50 million people. Okay. We're growing from 2000 to 2020. That wasn't predicted. Okay. Our population growth wasn't predicted. Plus, we all knew they were getting older. You heard about the baby boomers. In fact, since we've talked today, since we started talking, since Rhonda introduced me, 750 people have qualified for Medicare today. When you go home tonight, 10,000 people will qualify for Medicare just today in America. So our population's growing. Just visits based on population growth, not age. Three, 100 million, 150 million additional patient visits just based on the growth of our population. What else? Well, it gets older, okay? Remember what Charles Corral called Florida? He got in trouble for it, kind of. Remember what he said about Florida? What he called it? God's waiting room, remember? What he was talking about as we get older and older and older, the cause and effect of health care. So, again, this rising demand. 2012, we hit, the system saw a lot of changes, changed the ACA. We have about 11.4 uh, 11 million people in the ACA now. It's dropping. The question on the ACA, is it going to stay or go? I don't know. But, you know, the whole repeal and replace. Number one, it wasn't repeal, right? And number two, there's no replacement, right? So, again, we just don't know what's happening. Five million more people in Medicaid, which is good. Hospital consolidations. I mean, it's just, it's out there in the marketplace every day. Growing shortage, as I mentioned. Sadly, at the VA, we're doing a lot of work with the VA, meeting with them. 5,200 doctors short at the VAs across the nation. So everywhere there's a shortage. When that happens, is the ACA here to stay? Well, we thought so. I mean, who could predict that Trump got? I'm not making fun, but who could predict he was going to get elected? But there it is. And then it went to repeal. 
but we're right here now. And the supply is our bottleneck, only 800,000 doctors. As a matter of fact, politicians said he divided it out. It was in Washington, he said, Kurt, if you divide out our patient population in America, divide it by the number of doctors, that's one for every 600 people. And I said, you're right. And he said, well, that's enough, isn't it? I said, no. He said, well, yeah, it is. I know patient panels, it's like 3,000 to 3,500, right? But that's all specialties, what I told him. So if I had my lottery number and my doctor I got assigned was an OBGYN, right? Wouldn't do me any good, right? <laughs> and I was trying to explain that to him. And he goes, I get it now because this is the total number of doctors, all right? And here we are, male and female. This has changed dramatically. When I started in the business, one female doctor for every 12. But here's our issue. 38% of our, as we grow older, so do our doctors. And 13.1%, 66 and older. We've never had this old of a population. But what's unique, we have four different generations now. We have traditionalists, Gen X, Gen Y, and baby boomers. And they're all mixing together, okay? And when you're looking at this, what's unique? Guess who's hooking up with who? I guess I should, sorry, hooking up's not good, sorry. <laughs> guess who's partnering with each other? That's a little better. The traditionalists and, gen, and the millennials are partnering together. In fact, a great story, um, one of the millennials that I was talking to, I said, how's the doctor we recruited for you? He was a general surgeon, and he recruited a resident. He's always a great doctor, but he scares me. And I said, what's wrong? Is he good what, what, issues? And he goes, oh, he's a fantastic surgeon. He knows more than I'll ever know. I said, great. He goes, but he scares me. And I said, stop it. What's wrong? And he goes, well, he came in the office and said, look it, the future's here. Convenient care, paperless digital dictation, everything. He said, we're gonna make the whole office paperless. And the traditionalist looked at me and he said, he goes, man, I had a hard time with that. I said, what did you tell the doctor? And he said, well, I looked him right in the eye and he said, I'm with you, you're a great doctor. He said, but the office is gonna be paperless is about the same time that the restroom is paperless, okay? He was, holding his, he was holding his charts in front of him, right, like this when I was talking to him. So this is the issue that we face. And how do we stack up? We've been preaching this for years, okay? It's the first time I think I came to Washington 10 years ago to speak, I talked about the doctor shortage, but look at how many we have doctors per all these other developed countries. Again, we just don't have enough. Predictions of growth, only a 1% growth in our doctors over the next five years. But also what's growing at 6% nurse practitioners. We'll talk about that. And then it's not just us, the American Association of Medical Colleges, they said we have 21,002 few today, 121,000, this is May, this is two months old, or one month old, excuse me, 121,000, too few. When you look at it, you say, okay, 49,000 primary care, 72,000 specialists. Dr. Richard Cooper, sadly, is a good friend of mine, he passed away last year. He was a big proponent of this. He and Nancy Pelosi went at it a lot about this whole doctor shortage. And he said, primary care, we get it, but it's a specialty shortage, and why? Well, when you look at convenient care and you look at the specialty shortage, as we get older, we need these specialists. We do a separate little um, analysis in our review of uh, recruitment incentives by emails at the end if you want a copy. It was just released two weeks ago. It's called absolute demand. It's not the highest number of searches we do. The top three searches we did this year were family medicine, psychiatry, nurse practitioner, one, two, and three. Wow, big change. But absolute demand, we take the number of doctors in that specialty, divide it by the number of searches we did. Number one, pulmonology. Why? COPD is the only major disease in America that the death rate's gone up the last 40 years. Smoking, issues. Number two, oncology. Why? We have 18 million cancer survivors. It's fantastic. What we do with our cancer survivors is great, but we need more oncologists as these people live longer and longer to take care of them, have them live healthy, productive lives. So it's not just us. What's the AAMC do? They control medical education in America. They oversee it. So they're the ones that know. The shortage is here. So convenient care came out of this because people, when you can't get something, what do you do? You go around, okay? You know, you go around the system, okay? Is healthcare delayed, healthcare denied? Absolutely. Look at our wait times. Average wait time in our survey went up 30% from 2014. Family medicine wait time went up 50%. Friend of mine, um, young uh, lady I know, she went to a doctor, or she tried to get in to see a doctor, or dermat anybody see, tried to get in to see a dermatologist lately, by the way? It's tough, very tough. Uh, she couldn't get in, so she went to an urgent care center, and she, she did this overview, and the, the doctor said, listen, I'm not a dermatologist, but that doesn't look right, okay? 
Well, she got in the next day, I think it was. And he said, listen, I'm going to write you a, a special appointment. You need to see a dermatologist within the next two or three days. Well, a melanoma saved her life, okay? The dermatologist, she was going to have a 29-day wait to see them. Something, you know, she might not have lived. But this is our wait times went up. So when you look at it, the lied, look at the numbers. See if a doctor in a major metro area, average time to see a physician, average time just in Atlanta, for example. Seattle, Seattle was about 22 days. Then when you look at this and you say, okay, the wait times, what does that have to do with anything? It's very important. It's very important. You look at Massachusetts. They have the highest number of physicians to population ratio of any state in the union. Guess who has the highest wait times of any city in America? Boston. Why? Romney Care. Remember Romney Care? I mean, he got together, which was very unique. He got together with uh, Senators Kerry and Kennedy, and he got together and informed that 97% of the people in the state are insured through either the state exchange they have or Medicaid expansion. But it's hard to get in and see a doctor. And then the whole rise of convenient fare. You know, Uber, did they? They replaced taxis? Well, kind of. Why? Because you didn't have to call somebody. You can use an app, right? Plus, I live very close to the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. When I come in, a lot of times, our, the taxis won't take me because it's too short of a trip. They, don't, they won't get a big enough tip. Okay? But Uber, right? Netflix, what did they replace? Blockbuster. Who used to go, I used to do it for my grandkids, but who used to go Friday night run in there when the new DVDs would come in and they always run up to them, they walk up to them, they had all the cases and looked down, they were all out, right? Every Friday. So now I don't have to do that anymore, right? It just, Blockbuster went out of business because they didn't keep up with the times. Spotify, what did they replace? Come on, be honest with me. Who went to Warehouse Records when you were young? Remember where, that's where you bought all the records, right? That's where, I mean, every time I go, Warehouse Records doesn't exist now because of Spotify. Then Amazon, who knows? I mean, it's everything. You know, they're trying to do everything. They're going to be in healthcare no matter what. I mean, you're looking, they're looking to merge across the board with everybody, and why? Well, they think they can do it better. So who knows? But when you look at Uber, Urgent Care formed out of it. Netflix can be uh, retail centers, freestanding emergency centers, and what else? Technical medical delivery. It's incredible what we can do. Watson, right? IBM's Watson, one of the best, we'll talk about best diagnosticians in America, but we'll talk about that also. By the way, anybody know where Watson got his name? The computer? Watson was the first, everybody said it's like Watson, like uh, Sherlock Holmes? No. It's, uh, Watson was the first uh, president of IBM. He was the one that actually brought IBM to the forefront. So, also doctors have seen this in a lot of different ways. How? Clinics, the clinic at Walmart, sponsored by hospitals or SRHS clinics. Also, delivering healthcare through your phone. 40,000 healthcare apps right now, okay? My brother, he had a, he's fine, he had a heart attack. He has the new system where you put both your thumbs on the, on the iPhone and it tells you, gives you your EKG. Ford has a new Ford Taurus, have you seen it? Anybody? For cardiac patients, when you get in the car, it starts it up, it says be calm. You grip the wheel, EKG runs from you gripping the wheel at the two points on the, on the steering wheel sends, if you sign up for it, it'll send your EKG to your cardiologist so they know every day how you're doing. Then also, if it gets too high, you're driving, you're in traffic or you're in road rage, it'll say, cool it down, it'll show your pulse rate going up. Okay? And then Watson, obviously, diagnostician. But about 15 years ago, convenient care started. What two areas? Urgent care centers and retail clinics. We're going to talk about freestanding emergency rooms, but that's kind of a separate First of all, let me look into urgent care centers, all right? And about 30% of the population lives within about a 10-minute drive of convenient care facilities. Look at where they are. Shopping centers, freestanding buildings. By the way, the shopping centers, where did a lot of these go into? Old Blockbuster areas. Blockbuster had good locations, <laughs> they had, but they had a bad product. Now, in Dallas, Texas, when you look at what Baylor's doing, when you're looking and uh, they're doing a lot of convenient care or urgent care centers. They're going in, 90% of them are old blockbuster locations. They had great traffic, but they had a bad product, okay? Medical offices, some in there now, and then mixed use building. Now, like I said, this is different. When I grew up a long time ago, my pediatrician's office was about 40 yards from where I was born in the hospital. You know, just back then it was large medical office buildings. Anybody used to go to the, on the tile, they had green lines, and that's how you walk to your doctor's office. Okay, it's not that way anymore. 
the new mantras to be everywhere all the time. And again, they're popping up everywhere like Starbucks. And again, locations leveraged by major retailers. So Blockbuster, a lot of fast food areas that go out of business, fast food stores. A lot of the Chipotle switched in Dallas. Yep, Chipotle here, right? right? A lot of them switched. Urgent care centers went in there. They had good locations, but they just didn't have the, the product. So like Starbucks, everywhere. What else? Well, urgent care centers. Typically, you're staffed by primary care doctors. How they're staffed, 48% of them are family medicine specialists. About 30% are ED doctors that are transitioning, maybe working double. About 10% are internal medicine specialists, and then about 5% other, which is just a mix. That's how they're usually staffed. And they have nurse practitioners and PAs in support. 7,300 nationwide, and again, some states require them to be licensed, most don't. But why do you go there? Well, as everybody knows, if you know my grandchildren, they don't get sick eight to five, they really don't. And again, it's just the weekends, and they're open seven days a week. They're open after hours. In America right now, after four o'clock, only 40% of the time can you see a doctor in your local time zone. So that's what these are there for. That's why hospitals are supporting them, and also, all these different investments. What's the good thing about urgent care centers? When you look at them, only 4% of the patients that go there have to be transferred to an emergency department. So the patients are starting to know, if I have a broken leg, I don't go to an urgent care center. I go to the emergency department. But if I need stitches or I'm having an asthma attack or I just don't feel right, this is where I go. Okay? This is where I go. So it's the same thing. It's like if you want a steak, you go to a steak restaurant. You don't go to McDonald's, but people know now. What else? Well. Started to be like drive through healthcare. Who remembers, I'm sure aging myself, but who remembers the first drive through McDonald's? I remember I grew up in Newport Beach, California, one of the very first ones. Because before, you always had to get out of your car, and it was such a pain. And I think that's when everything really went bad, you know, this whole supersized thing. It was just so you didn't have to get out to get the, the high-fat products there. So, but again, 90% reported wait times 30 or less. Patient throughput, 60 minutes in and out, seven days a week, walk in. Average four and a half patients to, per hour and can go up to six to eight patients, depending. Who works in these areas? A lot of our newer doctors, because they're coming out and they're trying to figure out what they want in a practice style. Also, our resident survey told us last year, one of the key factors our residents told us is that they're ready for the practice of medicine, but they don't want anything to do with the business of medicine. This is a great location for them. A lot of hospitals are taking their doctors, some that are burned out, right? And we've had burnout out there. What do you need to do? Well, I just get, I'm so, a lot of ED doctors are ending up in urgent care because of why? Set schedules. It's not in the ED, there's different schedules. Somebody said, I wanna work this and this, and I wanna get back to doing what? And what do they do at convenient care centers? Patient care. That's what they're trying to do, get back to. And then hospitals adopt these convenient care strategies. Hospital ownership, about 30%. Corporations, a little less. Physician-owned facilities, that's the growth area. And again, they act as a funnel. They get patients into your system, especially the hospital-supported urgent care centers. And then the retail boom. They offer minor ailments. And a lot of this is also, the good news is only 3% of the people that go to retail centers end up going to the ED. They know where to go through. And this is where I ended up, okay? I ended up at Walgreens on the road. And then I asked them, and I read a little bit more about Walgreens. Walgreens now is the number two distributor of flu shots in America. Number two, under only who? The VA. They, on, they understand their market. Now, they're staffed by nurse practitioners and PAs. When I talked about our three, top three searches, number three was nurse practitioners. Where are they working? Here. They're also working in support of psychiatry in our federally qualified health centers, which I'll discuss. Number of visits, 10.5 million. Study I read the other day, I don't know if I'm, I'm convinced of it, but the study said about 80% of primary care in the future, over the next five years, is going to be distributed or delivered in urgent care centers and retail centers. What else is Walgreens doing? Well, managing your medications, all right? In fact, a lot of Walgreens now have PharmDs in there, which is really good, and they ask you to come in for a med check. You know, a friend of mine was having problems. He has the same thing. I have exercise and do his asthma, so does he. And he said, I'm just having problems. And I said, take your, take your meds into Walgreens. He was getting doubly medicated for the same malady. He was, seeing an, he was seeing an allergist, and he was seeing a pulmonologist, and he didn't put the two together. Now, what do our PharmDs do? They don't diagnose. They're not trained to it, but they treat diabetic patients. So they have PharmDs to go in and look at this and help you. 
So they do a really good job and they fill their niche, okay? Again, primary care-based clinics will be the largest providers of primary care services. So we're starting to see partnering with hospitals. Average cost for most common diagnosis, 484 to 543. Consumers report a satisfaction rate of 93%, 90% for quality. So the care is there. What else in retail centers? Transparency. Anybody been in the CVS? Maybe you guys may not. On the East Coast, and they may be here, I'm sorry. But on the East Coast, you walk in, they have a chart just like McDonald's. It says sore throat, $65. Sore throat with strep, $75. Transparent pricing. What are they getting? People that opted out don't have insurance, choose not to have insurance. That's who, that's who their partner is. And again, average cost in the ED, as we all know, about three to four times as much. And again, satisfaction rates. And then clinical affiliations on the rise. Ownership is consolidated. About six organizations in America control 90% of the retail cl clinics in America. Kind of sounds like our air system, huh? There's only five big carriers in America. But again, they're going to emerge and more than 100 partnerships between health systems exist. We're seeing a lot of these in Texas, where I'm from. And again, why is it there? Well, to provide the things that when we go to the doctor's office, like I got a call from the doctor's office the other day. They said, your shots do, your pneumonia shots do. And I said, why do I want to go in and pay a copay? and have the nurse do it, right? What I can do it here. And then Walgreens, I don't know if you've seen this, I encourage you if you're ever in DC, but they have these new flagship stores. It's 24 hour access. And what's unique about it, it's, in, uh, it's a four story building. And they have them now in Chicago and I think they have one in New York, but it's, uh, this one's in Chinatown in DC. And what happens on the top floor, there's juice bar, beauty advisors, lower level, a pharmacist, patients, nurse practitioner, Next level down is a complete nail salon, hair salon. The bottom of it's a Whole Foods market. So one-stop shop for all your health needs. What do we look, here's what you're doing. Here's my med check. I need to see a nurse practitioner. I gotta get dinner. It's right there, it's right there. And this is not just convenient care. This is what? Convenient living, okay? Then the wave of the future, optical, which is key. Most people don't have optical on their insurance, but again, this new flagship store has this new vision center. We're recruiting about 200 optometrists currently for this whole system. So growth areas that we're seeing, not only eye care, but what is it in America? What's causing our issues? Mental health, dental health, physiological health, all combined, okay? We're seeing a lot of these new centers, especially some of these retail urgent care centers are doing what? They have family medicine specialists partnering with who? Dentists, why? Well, I live around four doctors. It's kind of funny when I come on my, ride like a uh, road bike, pedal bike. When I come in, it's like the doctors kind of walk out because I take a while in the circle till I cool down. You know, it's just one of those things. And when they come out, it's like, you know, you guys in a neighborhood, you know, when somebody's drilling, you walk down and you're like, you know, a magnet, like, what are you drilling on now? What are you doing, you know? Well, they come out and we talk. And my neighbor was telling me, he's a cardiologist. A uh, patient of his, he was telling him, he said, listen, you have a problem with your heart, but your problem is your teeth get your teeth fixed, and he got his teeth fixed. He got a special dispensation to get dental cares. He had gum problems, he had gingivitis. Once his gum problems cleared up, his heart cleared up. These are things we don't think about, but the complete care delivery that's being delivered in these areas, okay? And what else? Well, Kaiser Health Hubs. I know they're not here now, they're in California, they're in Maryland, but these are little areas that are out where people are. The whole mantra, be everywhere all the time. They're out in these urban areas where people live, in suburban areas too. And what are they? Well, this, they have a healthy living room. Love that, don't you? Okay. But it's a health hub, and they basically have a way you can go. They have a track you can go to, work out. Um, people are there to take your blood pressure, monitor that. And then if something happens, something happens, you just get it good and you just don't feel well, they get a specialist or a primary care doctor, telehealth, look at you. Well, this is doing this. You need to go to the ED, so you don't go right to the ED. But the good news is, if you do, not good news, but if you do have to go to the ED, you're already in the system. So they just take you and right, run you right in. Health hubs, these are key. Delivery, and this is where people go. You know, how many times do you go to the doctor's office and people lined up to get their blood pressure? You can get it done here, okay? And then freestanding emergency centers. Now, the, let me tell you, the, the debate's still out on this. But what were these were designed for is what? Um, when I started in the business, 8,300 hospitals in America, now there's 5,500. So when these hospitals closed, so did the EDs. These were supposed to be in areas where people needed emergency care, didn't have to drive 100 miles. 
So they started in Texas. I don't know why, you know. I lived there. I came from California, but Texas is just Texas. But they're, they're there right now. And they're typically owned by hospitals or independent profit groups. But some of the Texas facilities, when they came out, their stock was at $50. Now it's at like $5. The reason why, they started opening in all these high-income areas, saying people don't want to go stay two hours, six hours in the emergency room. My daughter, she's fine, but she had to go to the emergency room the other day. I didn't know it. She didn't want to tell me. She spent six hours there. But these were designed for ease of care, quickness. But a problem was is they don't, if they're not associated with a hospital, they're not like Imtala. They don't have to be open 24-7. And again, they're off contract. We've had people in Dallas go in for stomach aches, uh, heart palpitations, $12,000 bill, not covered by insurance. So that's why these are uh, going away in popularity. I see them advancing in areas, in rural areas, that don't have emergency rooms because the hospitals have closed, but the jury's still out on it, again. And also convenient care for the underserved, our federally qualified health centers. They do a great job. A lot of you partner with them. A lot of you work with them. But they serve over 24 million people. And that's twice the number from 2000. And again, they support both sides of the aisle. And they employ about 170,000 staff. And that's doubled. And again, what they do? Mental health, dental health, physiological health. Most of the recruitment we do into there is nurse practitioners in support of psychiatry. Because it all starts with mental health. You know, again, mental health doesn't kill you but the problems manifest themselves and do kill you. So again, they're doing a great job, but this is the convenient care for the underserved. We're starting to see a lot more cooperation. I'm working with Mississippi Hospital Association with a couple of their facilities that are trying to get over this hump of Mars and Venus. Because again, at five o'clock on Friday, they put a little sign at the, convenient, at the community health center saying, if you have a problem, go to the emergency room. And the hospitals were going, listen, can we do something else? And we look at something different. So these are more cooperative uh, future endeavors, but again, they do a great job. And then there's virtual doctors, the rise of telemedicine, okay? Return the doctor's health call. Again, we in California, we work with Heal. Anybody heard of Heal before? It's an app, it's like the word Heal. And you hit the app, okay? It's $99. A doctor's in an Uber car driving around with an assistant. Come to your house. Visits are about 400% more. The average doctor visits 12 to 15 minutes. They spend about 45 minutes, take care of you, do whatever they need to do. If you need to go to the ED, they put you in the Uber car, take you back, okay? And what's unique about it, they're starting to spring up in Dallas and they're using them for social determinants of health. How are they doing that? Well, the doctor goes into your house. What do they look at? Your pantry, what are you eating? Do you have heat in the winter, cooling in the summer? Do you have clean water? These are areas we're gonna see as social determinants of health continue to expand and cost our healthcare system, we have to do something about it. But HEAL is one of the new returns of the house call in a car, okay? Telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, analytics, referral services, telehealth, patient outcomes. Again, rural facilities in America, if you're not on t uh, telestroke and telepsych, again, the future is kind of grim. That's something that you have to be on. And telemedicine, is it grown? Absolutely. Delivery of it, yes. And what's it? why has it been beneficial? Convenient. And again, in a lot of cases, people can't get to the facility. And they're expanding access. Dip, Zipnosis. They started, anybody heard of Zipnosis before? Started in Minnesota. And it's basically you get online with a physician assistant, a PA. And they said it'll never work. And again, it's basically, here's my problem. They're not even looking at you. It's just email contact. PA's asking you questions, coming back. A lot of times they'll send a script. They said it'll never work. It's 49 bucks. 13 different states now. Doctor on demand. One-on-one -on -one sessions. That's a picture of doctor on demand. So basically, pick up your iPhone, talk to a doctor, your iPad. Teladoc, same one, one-on-one. -on -one. And then ZocDoc. Have you used ZocDoc before? It's appointment scheduling. How many times you call up and say the doctor has nothing today? Well, you can go on ZocDoc now, just like you can look up who books tea times on, on the internet. Okay? Or you can look up and say, well, it's funny, because from two to three, he's doing nothing. And so you can look at it and book through ZocDoc. Because a lot of times, doctors are using open access scheduling. We'll leave a part of their, which is smart, leave a part of their appointment day open for what? Not necessarily walk-ins, but ZocDoc, you can schedule an appointment. And you can look at their schedule. And you say, well, I can't get in today, but he's open tomorrow at 8. Let me book it. Boom. Let me get it in there. So expanding access. And why do we have to? Because more people have access to health care. 
That's what the ACA was for, and I, mean, I totally agree with that. But as they get more people to have access, we need to serve them more and more. Robots. Come on. Got to be honest with me. Who watches Big Bang Theory? Come on. Remember when Sheldon was a telepresence robot because he thought he was valuable, too valuable to go to work? Well, we have these now, and I, see, I saw one work. But it's mobile video conferencing, and you move the doctor into the room, and there they are. They're asking questions. They can see the patients. We're seeing more and more of this with telepsych. Why? They have to visually see that patient. They have a person there that monitors the robot and can tell the doctor afterwards what condition the patient was in, did they appear homeless, you know, pass, I hate to put it this way, pass the smell test. The doctor has to look at the patient. But this is a new way. It's very efficient. And again, they can see the doctor's face. It's more comforting when you see what's going on, especially if you're, especially in your medical duress. And then robots, Gigi can clean the room now using ultraviolet light. My next door neighbor, the other doctor, the one of four, he worked at Presbyterian in Dallas when they had Thomas Duncan there. Remember, sadly, the Ebola patient that passed away. They used Gigi to clean up the room. Okay? And what it does is it takes the DNA, changes it of the virus, so it's not infective. But the key factor is, I was telling one of my employees about the story, she said, I used to work at Enterprise. And I said, really? She goes, yes. we." had a van that took that robot away. Well, the van had to be crushed because nobody wanted to be associated with a robot that had been associated with Ebola, and sadly, but it works very well. Robotic nursing assistant, it helps lift patients. How many times do you have a problem with your nurses having back issues trying to lift patients? It's great. Robots are out there. V-Bot, have you seen it work before? I was at a convention, I had it done to me. You put your arm in, tracks using laser, finds the vein, how many times have you, somebody been sitting there and trying to find a vein for you, okay? And then Da Vinci, so, you know, obviously. A lot of different areas we're using him for female surgery, mostly for men for prostate surgery. It's a better way. And this is, when you say convenient, it's also helped. Because prostate surgery in the past, neck to your groin, you were out a month. You had to completely split open. You know, I had to, I don't mean to say this, but I had prostate surgery, Da Vinci. I was riding my bike in four days. So again, it's not only convenient, but at the same time, you get back into the workforce. So these are new areas. But are robots going to replace our doctors? No. In fact, I was talking to a doctor about emotional intelligence and this whole change. He said, they do a great job. They have more information. Because there's so much more information the doctors need to know. But he said, robots are great, but one thing they can't do is the Heimlich maneuver, right? So think about that. We, do. we think we're going to get rid of our doctors. And then diagnostician, Watson. Great story. A woman in Japan, rare form of leukemia. They worked on her for, um, I think, at six months. It found her form in 10 minutes because it can run all the permutations. But it still haven't had a doctor to treat her afterwards. But these are great stories. Again, what else is changing? We're training our surgeons now virtually. Why? Get them up to speed quicker. When I had my procedure, they asked me, who do you want? And I said, who's done it the most? That's who I want. I want the person that's done it that many times. Now we can get our doctors trained using haptic feedback. Okay, It's this new model where these new models, my other neighbor's North Peak surgeon, he showed me his. And we were looking at a, uh, it's a digital patient. But as you were sawing through the bone, when you got to the bone, the computer made the saw rough like you were sawing through it. And I was like, this is incredible. This is like riding. You know, how do our pilots learn how to fly jetliners? Simulators. So it's simulator now to train. So this is great. And also innovation. All these different streams to help. OK? Have you heard of Tweet P before? Like Twitter? And then P, like P, P, E. Have you heard? Um, my granddaughter, who Cynthia knows, um, when she was going through her phase, my friend worked for Huggies. And he gave me this little thing. It's called Tweet Pete. It's this big. Okay? It's got Velcro on the back side of it. Okay? You put it on the outside of the diaper, and when it detected, it detected moisture, it, gave, it sent you a text. No joke. It said, change diaper. So when I got it, of course, being a good grandfather, I just texted my wife and said, change your granddaughter's diaper. That's how I got around it. <laughs> Tweet P. This is how we're going to monitor our patients, OK? I have a special thing on my bike now, where basically it's a harness. If I stop for more than 10 minutes, or I have a cardiac incident, it alerts my wife, and she can come pick up the carcass. That's how it works. 
But that's how we're going to start following and prevent all these issues. We have the technology, so why not use it? It's not going to replace doctors, but it's going to help. This helps us quite a bit. This really helped her get potty trained very early. So, and then golden age of medical innovation. Think what we're doing. Targeted therapies. I was meeting with the president of MD Anderson in Houston. He said, Kurt, you know, chemotherapy three, four years is going to be a thing of the past. It's just too invasive. We can do so much better. Nano devices being input to your body that have radioactive microbes in them that attach themselves to tumors. A lot more effective. Okay. Bioprinters. This is the one in uh, Clemson in the Carolinas. What are they doing? They're taking your cell media using bioprinters and printing livers and kidneys. Okay. Now, the cells don't live that long, but they predict in five years they'll have livers and kidneys they can print that'll be able to transplant in your body. Xenotransplants, what are those? From another human entity, pig hearts into humans that match DNA. Hasn't been done yet. I think a couple of people at my work have them. I just want to accuse them. <laughs> but we'll have pig hearts in humans. So can you imagine we had an unlimited supply of livers, kidneys, and hearts? And when I travel, you know, I always, I don't know if you ever noticed this, when you get on the plane, the door, you look in the door, there's a little tag, like a VIN number. I always look and see when the plane was made. And a lot of time I walk in, they're brand new, and they're made 20 years ago. Why do they look that way? Because they replaced the parts. We're doing that now, okay? Gene therapy. Good and bad. What can they do? Pre-birth gene therapy, ADD, birth defects. What else? Hair color? Yeah. Eye color? Yeah. I mean, is it, are we close to playing God? I don't know. But smart helmets, neuroprosthetics, helmets now that for high school students, that high school athletes, excuse me, that you can predict, you can tell the helmet has a sensor that they've had a concussion or not. Origami robots. Anybody heard of this before? Little, looks like an origami. It's in a little pack. You swallow it. I didn't know this. 10,000 children in America every year, ladies and gentlemen, swallow button batteries, thinking they're candy or food. And what happens, just due to the fact of the composition of that battery, sticks to the stomach, stomach line and you can't get it out. So they swallow this robot, or this origami robot, small. It opens up inside and it looks like a claw, sort of like an origami. Doctor can guide it around using a magnet, capture the battery, pass it through the stomach so they don't have to have open stomach surgery. Okay? Great stuff. 3D printed casts. Who had broken arms? Who had knitting needles? You know, right? Well, these 3D casts fit almost perfectly. It's great. Pill cam, eye knife. This is a new thing a good friend of mine in Dallas is working on. Anybody heard of eye knife before? Dermatological knife. Basically a sensor hooked up to a computer. If you've had issues like I have, well, not issues, but I grew up in Newport Beach and I surfed every day, you know, since I was seven. And nobody told me I needed Sunblock 2000 for vampires, right? They didn't tell me that. Back then, you know, skin cancer just wasn't a thing. But I go in and get, you know, things cut off every six months. But this new procedure, you know, before if you ever been in, not saying I don't want to who has, but they take a section, do a frozen section, determine if it's skin cancer or not. This knife, it's being patented. It'll be able to cut through and detect cancerous skin before going back and doing right. So during the procedure, they say, yes, it's cancerous. Get it out right now. Don't have to go back. Don't have to do the frozen section. So incredible things we're doing in the marketplace. Just incredible. And mobile apps. There's more than 40,000 healthcare apps on iTunes. Just incredible. Amazon's wearable marketplace. This is what got them into it, by the way. They started seeing uh, millions of units, 6 million units. And what are these? These are obviously their iFits. Is that what it is, iFit? What? What is it? I'm sorry. I fit? Fitbit. Fitbit, sorry. Fitbit. I have a Garmin that I use for my bike, you know, and everything. But all these new wearable devices, I mean, it's incredible. So Amazon said, we're selling all these. So guess what Amazon does? Well, let's get into this, right? We're selling them. Let's get into it. And that was their lead in when these things started just flying out the door. And again, mobile apps. American Well was the first kiosk. $49 for 10 minutes with a physician. Just send a picture of your sore throat. Doctor said, it looks like strep. Here's your... E-script, back on your phone, put it in your eye, put it in your eye notes, take it to the pharmacy, boom. And then do-it-yourself medicine, wireless home monitoring, uh, own blood pressure, weight, everything. But the key is how do we pay doctors for this? As more and more of this happens, how many times we're we gonna get texts, phone calls following up, 
but there's no coding yet for this. And this is something that we have to really work out. We gotta pay for doctors for these non-face-to-face visits. Qualcomm, remember this? Okay, who's this? Who's the Star Trek guy, come on? Girl, excuse me also. Bones, yeah, it's Dr. McCoy. Remember what he had on the show? Tricorder, right? So what happened, a couple years ago, somebody said, wow, the show, remember it was really great. Well, but think about Star Trek. Was it futuristic? Yeah. Was it accurate? Absolutely. I mean, I remember seeing Captain Kirk with his flip phone, and I thought that would be the greatest invention at the time. And a little about three, year, three years ago, my wife, I mean, wife, excuse me, my daughter had to come to me and say, Dad, that flip phone's really, really lame, you know, she's... <laughs> Because I still had a flip phone, so I had to switch. But at the time, but also the tricorder ran it up and down the body. What happened? Okay, everything. So Qualcomm came out and said, "Let's see if we can do this." Okay, and basically they said, "We envision a future where consumers can have their healthcare diagnosed in ways more accurate, more accessible, more understanding than today's doctors." Well, <laughs> I don't think so. But basically, what happened? They came out with the tricorder, and this. There was a $10 million prize, okay? Now this company won, but it didn't do everything. It had to do four things. It had to detect cancer non-invasively, detect viruses. The whole idea was if you can detect a virus, blood pressure, EKG, all that. That's the, the actual tricorder. They didn't win the $10 million prize, but they were the winners of it. It didn't detect cancer non-invasively. That was a problem, but it does detect viruses. So what's unique about it is like if you have kids or grandkids, you know, the flu season, they always say, oh, the teacher said if I'm sick, I should stay home. Well, you can pass this up and down so you don't have a virus, go back to school. So <laughs> great concept. It's almost there, but it's not there yet because it's a hard thing to do. But that's what the tricorder is. Hooks to its own monitor. Uh, this goes right to your uh, medical records. And this is not a tricorder, but it's called a polymerase machine, fast PCR. Why haven't we used them before? Because they're really expensive. But what they do, you take a swab and you go in. How long does it take to get DNA results? Who's done the 23andMe before? A couple of days to get back, right? Well, this basically, it's so fast. They're coming down in cost now. They used to be 10 grand. They're around two or three. But submit a sample. They'll run it at the start. Kind of like when you go through the airport and they take your thing to see if you have any explosives. You're good. Um, basically, they'll even have a diagnosis, a DNA breakdown before you leave the office. How much time is this going to save? How much accuracy is it going to be? It's great. But again, cost. And then, can the tricorder replace this guy? Remember him? You know, <laughs> they always say, you play to your audience, right? So I'm in Princeton talking, did this kind of speech. They said, will you come in and not talk about your regular stuff, but talk about future of healthcare. Talk about careers in healthcare. So I put him up there, and they looked at me like I had lobsters growing out of my ears. You know, they had no idea who he was. But they found out how old I was. They were smart kids in Princeton. And one of the kids at the question at Q&A, he said, listen, he goes, uh, I have a question for you, Mr. Mosley. He said, because they found out how old I was. I said, yeah, what's your question? He said, is it really true that Paul McCartney was in a group before Wings? <laughs> smart kid. But anyway, I was trying to explain to him who Marcus Welby was, OK? And then finally, I, I hit on something. I'm sitting there up there. You know how, who, who does speaking in the room? Just show hands to your groups. Yeah, you're up there, and you're, just, you're, you're, you're in the surf. You're getting knocked around. You're just like gasping for air. So I'm going, what am I going to do? And I said, well, his partner, remember his partner, Stephen Kiley? He drove the motorcycle to work, right? Well, that's James Brolin. His son is Josh Brolin. They knew who he was, right? He's the big actor. So that's how I broke through there. But let me talk about the show. He used a lot of electronic stuff even back then. He was your first concierge doctor, right? And he was your first off-the-grid doctor. Remember what's unique about the show? James Brolin was the new resident riding the motorcycle, but he was the one that stuck by the book. Marcus Welby didn't. Remember, he had placebos, did all kinds of unique things. In fact, the kid, at the show at the time, there were, it was the number one show on TV at the time. And it was great, because when you went there, you know, you went there, saw him, you were fixed. Your wife went there, she was fixed. Your kids went there, your family was fixed. When you got home, your yard was landscaped. It was a perfect show. <laughs> you know, and that's what it was. But think about, are they gonna replace this? But how did we go, ladies and gentlemen, from this guy to this guy in 40 years? And I take umbrage, and I'll close with this. Um, our doctors are still at the key of this. All these new tools. 
everything, but they had to have doctors to take care of this. Anybody know what the show was originally called? I don't know it was House, but it was called Chasing Zebras Circling the Drain. Why, you ask? Well, it was a show that was supposed to show how well we did as doctors. And chasing zebras is a medical term doctors use. It's basically a patient has a malady, but they don't like a zebra. They don't know what it is. It's camouflage. And he does that in the show. And it's incredible. Like I said, 18 million cancer survivors. We have people living longer than ever. We do a phenomenal job. Our health care is the best in the world. I don't know if you heard recently, the Quebec, not the prime minister of Canada, but the prime minister of Quebec flew to Miami Heart Hospital to have his procedure done. Because we have good stuff here. But the show, and then also uh, Circling the Drain was about end-of-life care and how we could take care of people as they transition. And so somebody turned it around and said, no, let's show how fallible our doctors are. This is burnout. Right? This is, he is the poster child of burnout. They wanted to show how fallible he is. Remember what everybody say? He's got a drug problem. Remember he's addicted to pain medication. Right? What everybody say? He's lied on patient rapport. Right? How about hospital manners? Not good. But I take umbrage, because this was a good show in concept, but they turned it into the problem doctors. And that's not what it is. Doctors face so many different things today. Electronic health records, being paid on different codes. I mean, it's a tough market out there. But never, these tools aren't going to replace this guy or this guy, OK? And then by the way, nobody picked up that $10 million prize yet. So that uh, tricorder prize is still out there. So let me leave it with this. I hope we, I've enjoyed visiting with you this morning, sharing our concepts reason we know about this, we're recruiting into these environments. But things are changing. Convenient care is going to be here, as is everything in life. But we can't forget the two most important parts is the patient-physician relationship. And that's what this is the key to. And I think we're right at time. And again, I'll leave with this. Sergio Canavero, Ray Jiaoping. We're about three months away from the first head transplant in human history. They're going to take, and see, some people think it's a farce, but they've already done, gone through this. He's an Italian and Chinese neurosurgeon, uh, or not, he's both, but uh, Sergio Canavero's Italian, Ray Jiaoping's Chinese. They have a gentleman that's like a Stephen Hawking type individual, neck down, completely paralyzed, form of Lou Gehrig's disease. He's a theoretical phys physicist, brilliant brain. Take his head and put it on a donor body. Okay. $13.1 million, million to do the procedure, 17 hours. People say, what a waste of time. Think of it was your brother or sister, your mom or dad. So this is the future. And people say, well, that's the future of medicine. The future's here right now. Okay? Be aware it's coming, and it's coming like a freight train. I appreciate your time today. I'll take your questions. Any of the questions or any of the surveys I talked about, all these white papers on convenient care, that's my email. You can sure uh, uh, get a hold of me. I'll be glad to send them to you.